morning everyone. My name is Lexi and I'd like to welcome you to the event How Can We Do Democracy Better? hosted by Localising Lianganook and Democracy for Dinner. We're meeting today on the lands of the Jara people of the Jar Jawarung clan and I would like to pay my respects to Elders past, present, emerging and future. I'd specifically like to acknowledge Elder Rodney Carter who intended to be here tonight and may be with us here in the audience. We also have Nicole Rowan, the Greens candidate for Northern Victoria Upper House, joining us up this, this evening. Where is she? There you are. <laughs> Hello. Hello. <laughs> We've all come here together, many of us frustrated by adversarial party politics, but hopefully all optimistic about the future. We're unsure of exactly what the future of our democracy will look like, except that we know that it can be better, and indeed it must be better so that we can navigate challenging times and build a future that works for all Australians. Conversations like this are happening all around Australia and indeed the world, and new models are already being trialled, refined and developed. We hope tonight some alternative models of democracy, governance and decision making are highlighted that might support a vibrant and sustainable future for us here in central Victoria and in Australia. We won't answer all the questions tonight. In fact, I hope that you leave with more questions than you came with. However, you will have a chance to ask some of your questions in the second half of the event this evening. So, to start, I'll be joining special guest Richard Walsh, uh, author of Reboot, who has travelled from Sydney to join us here today, and locals Jen Barlow and Cam Walker. And we'll be talking about democracy, the system we've got, how we might fix it, and how we might get started na and navigating that change. So please welcome me in joining my guests. All right, so according to the Democracy Index, Australia is a full democracy and the eighth most robust democracy in the world. Mm. What do you think, Richard? <laughs> <laughs> how would you define democracy? One of the things I like to say about democracy is that I think we've been raised on the idea you're either a democracy or you're not, and I'm, I, I'm not, not aware of the index you're talking about, but I, it's a useful thing to think, concentrate on, because I certainly believe that there's a continuum. Mm. Obviously, there's, there's things that definitely aren't democracies, but somehow I think we kind of have been raised in this idea, yeah, we're a democracy, America's a democracy, uh, China isn't a democracy, and so on. And I don't think that's useful. I think, I think it is, and it's worth the debate. I mean, part mm. two of the things which should not, things I've covered in my book, but which I've felt passionately about all my life, is I happen to believe that compulsory voting is, leads to a greater democracy than, mm. than voluntary. Uh, it's better for a government to actually represent all the people, even if they have to be dragooned to, to vote. Uh, secondly, I happen to believe that preferential voting is, is much preferable to, to um, first past the post. So there are two things we, in fact we are in which we mm. are superior, of course. But the problem is that we come fr we have come into a very parlous situation, I think because it's, it's Australia at its provincial worst. We're not terribly aware of how the rest of the world functions. We're not aware of all the different possibilities. There are many countries that are very democratic and which have very different systems. We're not even aware of the system in, America, in New Zealand, which after all New Zealand has turned out in the last decade or so three absolutely terrific prime ministers. Mm. Um, and, and although they basically never have majority governments over there, they always need some kind of uh, uh, arrangements, coalition type arrangements, which w once upon a time, certainly in my childhood, we was kind of raising the idea that uh, um, you know, uh, uh, having a majority government was the way to go. And we, uh, certainly my father was a very conservative man, had total disdain for what he called the continent, mm. um, because the French and the Italians and so on um, didn't seem to, uh, ever have a majority government. Uh, so we were kind of raised on that and raised on the idea that Britain always had a majority, Westminster system. Well, it's a long time since actually uh, um, England, has, or the UK rather, has, has had that. So, um, yeah, so I, I mean, I just, I don't think that democracy is functioning for us. It has become very adversarial. Another statistic you could have told us, <laughs> which I do allude to, is that we actually have the lowest participation rate in the Western world. We have fewer members of our society who actually belong to political parties than in other uh, comparable countries. And that mm. really means that 
we aren't enamoured with our system and we have to find a system, we have to have enough imagination to ask ourselves, are there other ways of doing it? Obviously, I'm an advocate of one particular way of going, but I really, at gatherings like this, I'm not particular. I'm very happy to talk about my own ideas, but the thing, the overriding belief I have is that we have to make people aware there are many different ways of expressing, even within Australia, obviously, uh, uh, the Hare Clark system, which exists in, in Tasmania, most people aren't aware that, uh, you know, within living memory, the ACT decided to switch across to Hare Clark, which is a totally different system. Um, we just aren't aware of these things. Do you mind if I interrupt? Yeah, you so do, does please. That, does that um, itself, that system of voting, is that going to change things? Because I actually think it's not the voting system that's the problem per se, but the actual the fact that our major parties have the influence of um, they've just been put up by lobbyists well, and quite they're not representing the people anymore. Hair Clark, Hair Clark's no good in an adversarial system. That's, I think, probably part of the reason why um, we now have a majority government in Tasmania, which is a Hair Clark system. I think people have become impatient. When you, have, when you try to have a coalition government within a system where everyone's adversarial, where everyone's fighting, and, and, and I, I know we have a Green person here, I mean, even where within the Greens there's adversarial, adversariality as well, um, that doesn't work. You've got to get beyond adversariality. You've got to get to a situation... What we've basically got... What, what we're calling democracy is if we were sitting in a restaurant and we were confronted by a waiter who said, you can either have this menu or that menu. And the moment you choose pea soup, which is on this menu, you're going to have to eat the rest of this. And the whole the system we have, this <laughs> thought that it's meant... And, and it's under, un, underlined by the Tasmanian result. I'm sure, without looking into the mind of all Tasmanians, Tasmanians voted back the Hodgman government because they at least felt that it was a, quite a competent government and, and I wouldn't have voted for them, but I understand why people would think they're competent. Partly that's a mistake. They don't understand that the whole of the world is, is prospering more than it did five years ago and every government that's in power, whether it's Trump or whether it's Hodgman, is claiming that they single-handedly created uh, prosperity. But, but that's David another Walsh. story. <laughs> huh? What? David Walsh did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Maybe they've watched it more of it. Um, but the thing is that people don't like... Uh, th they weren't very fond of the of, of Labour-Green mm. coalition because it didn't work for them and it didn't work because there was still adversariality in the system. But to have a system where where we can jump beyond that and where we basically aren't, aren't empowering people with anything, where the major decisions have to be made either through referenda or have to be made through a different system, the kind of system that I advocate, that's... Yeah, that's the way to go. Uh, mm -hmm. At the moment, um, we and the worst thing in our democracy is the 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 way in which the the political parties become more and more condensed. Meaning, the number of people who actually belong to these political parties is is becoming smaller and smaller. The only people left are the zealots and the ambitious, and they're the most dangerous people imaginable. <laughs> they don't even reflect the views of the people that vote. So, take a party like the Labour Party. The people who vote for Labour, I think, are a different cohort to the people who actually belong to the party. The party will pursue the people who actually are in there because they're fighting their own little battles and full of ambition of their own. They're fighting for policies which, in fact, are different from what actually many people... Same with the Greens, same mm. with the Libs. Yes, so it's left and right, and actually a lot of people aren't left or right. There are a whole amount exactly. of different things. Mm. Oh, yeah, they're left on this and right on that. Yeah, yeah. 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 You also mentioned... Um, Richard, that you describe politicians as being reckless with the truth. So I wonder yeah, if well, you I mean, might I, comment a little bit about yeah, your experience of... Come in, can. <laughs> but reckless, of, recklessness with the truth. Of how, you know, of how that impacts your work, try, trying to differentiate between um, truth and fact and opinion and lobbying. And, and how, is that, you know, how is that impacting sort of your areas of work or how have you experienced that? Certainly... Um, if not reckless with the truth, then subservient to the ideology, I guess mm. is what I see, which is um, the bald-faced lies that come to protect positions. So this summer, as an example, we've had a hot summer, we've had you know huge demand on our energy supply, and one party, the Liberals or the Coalition, have said we're all going to die because the system will collapse, which is part of their attempt to undermine the drive towards renewables, which is part of their attempt to hang on to fossil fuels. And so they created this entire narrative 
that actually didn't play out. We didn't have major blackouts, as, as they were um, attempting to suggest mm. would happen. They were uh, enabled by the Herald Sun and the Murdoch Press to, to prosecute that case. And it just went nowhere. You know, we got through it OK and the world didn't end. Um, and unfortunately, they're not being held to account. So it's as if they didn't make those claims November, December, January, and now we're out the other side and no one holds them to account. So. Um, it, it's the lying in the pursuit of the greater good from their perspective, which is the adversarial politics. And, mm. and that is the basic problem we have, which is it is all about point scoring against the other side. It's not actually about building policy that is for the greater good. Mm. What about you, Jen? Uh, well, I guess my work, I do um, a little bit of journalism, so I'm one of those pathetic people who haven't helped politicians <laughs> to account can. But I tell you what's happening in, in, in the old print format um, that I work for, and it's going online now, and, and it's, I work in the rural sector. Um, there's less and less money, uh, so there's less time to do things, less mm. time to do the research. So I think there's a con, there's sort of confluence of, of that mm the politics and, and that change as well that's affecting things. And I still don't think that online, um, uh, I mean, we, we're getting better at it and there is a lot of good journalism out there, but I, I still think it's a struggle for people mm. who want to, you know, get in there and do really good stuff. Yeah. Um, I just, I think that needs looking at too. But yeah, I agree. Mm. The adversarial nature is kaputsky and um, I actually think, I don't know whether I read Jeffrey Robertson or someone like that say that even in, in the law, it's failing there as well. Mm. So um, I think there has to be change. But I was interested to ask you, Richard, if, if it's not working, why is it persistent? Why, you know, how, how come if there's only 40,000 or 50,000 people in the Labor Party mm. as members, how does it continue? Well, the problem is that our election, as the members of the parties become smaller, elections are, have always been expensive. And they're actually becoming more expensive because once upon a time there were lots of volunteers and they were the members of the party. They went out and knocked on doors. Now, you know, the latest scandal with, with uh, Cambridge uh, Analytica, I mean, mm -hmm. that's that kind of that's a scandal in its own right. But of course, that information, what they provide, costs a lot of money, mm -hmm. real money, mm -hmm. and so elections are costing a lot of money. And so the parties survive because because actually they're the only people that can afford to run an organised um, election, and and therefore really good independents, whether they're smaller parties like the Greens or Xenophon or whatever, can't get in there because they simply don't have the money. Um, to but do I, don't, I don't agree with that actually really? because yeah well I see um, Kathy McGowan as a, a yep. rural representative and an independent in Indi and um, I think she's done an extraordinary job and she did that by um, having her community come forth and say she's got them engaged she has them coming down to camp well the community came first they actually were the ones who said uh, we don't know, we don't like what's going on in Indi. Mm. And a few people, some people got together, I think there were about 12 of them, and they said, well, do we not like it enough to really do something about it? And I think she may have been one of those people, but there are ways. Mm. There are ways well, yes, there are, but I mean, with the greatest respect to what she's done, she's never had, I mean, there is a duopoly. Mm. And when the yes. duopoly decides it's under threat, they don't feel threatened by her. And she's never had... She, no one, both the Libs and the Labs have never got together to smash Cathy no. uh, in the way that they got together to smash Xenophon. I'm not necessarily a signed-up Xenophon fan. Mm. But he was smashed by everybody, mm. uh, the, the two major parties getting together and saying, we are, this is a threat to our way of life. This guy, originally, they thought, my God, he could be Premier, he could be... You know, get lots of, uh, mm. and so they really made a, a significant attempt to smash him out of the business. I assure you that if the parties put their minds to it to smash Cathy McGowan, she would not win Indy. And if they put someone better than Sophie Mirabella up against her, she probably would. Have, no, but seriously, there's been no concern. But there has, in other in other areas, been a. The, the problem is that the the coming back to the main question what about. What about if there are enough people who did that? Who did what? Yeah, what? Who, who went out in electorates and made their seats marginal and ran as independents. Like Cathy has done. Yeah. Like, instead of having one or two, like uh, Andrew in um, Tassie. Yeah, mm -hmm. Andrew Wilkie in Tassie. Like, have a whole, like, 
you know, have lots of them. That I don't. I mean, I, I, no. I think I think the duopoly would get them. Mm. I mean, I mean, I think that's what happens. That that they don't have the result. I mean, it is easier in a country electorate than in a city electorate mm. because there's a greater sense of community. You have a greater sense of community here. You people are more interested in this topic than 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 you know. If we we had the same meeting in in the electorate of Batman, um, because because there is a greater sense of community. So there's always been the independents have always done better. Certainly, I mean, my knowledge is more in New South Wales where we've had many you know on the south coast a number of uh, very good uh, independents, uh, uh, Andron, which who was in Orange and so on. So there. It's 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 and of course I mean originally Tony Windsor and and Rob Shapcock both country because the local people can build their reputation up through local government they can mm. be the mayor of the or the shire mm. president or whatever and can build their reputation up and that's quite good in a way that because the urban life cosmopolitan life is so so today so impersonal I think it's really hard for people to do that there. But I, I want to just come back to the question you both were talking about, about, about um, you know, failure of, of the truth. The real enemy is disengagement. Mm -hmm. I mean, disengagement, yeah. it, uh, uh, um, untruth, the, 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 is, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. there's a fertile ground mm -hmm. where people aren't engaged enough mm -hmm. and therefore people can tell them those outrageous lies, mm -hmm. whether it's about climate or what it is, because they're just not engaged mm. enough. Mm. I, mean, I mean, certainly in my lifetime, having gone through things, you know, when we started protesting against them, it's my generation against the Vietnam War, you know, only about 10% of people were asking these questions, but we were able to get people engaged and over a period of time build, build it up. But at the moment, there's cynicism and disengagement, mm. and therefore that's very fertile ground for, for people for fear campaigns. Mm. Yes. And in politics, I mean, in business, they always say the stock exchange thrives on fear and greed mm. and there's always a balance either people are very greedy and they're buying stock or very fearful and they're selling stock that's how it works but in politics fear works fear trumps everything and you can work up and both parties know that I mean I'm not a uh, I mean the Labour Party used the Medis scare last time as, mm. a, as a you know and there was some truth in what they were saying but it was they they over blew it um, so, so fear works, and, and and when you put money behind it, you know, and that's part of what's happened in, in the three elections have been in the last few months, mm. the two state elections and Batman, um, a fear, fear of the unknown, and 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 obviously when you're talking about changing democracy, fear of oh, has it been tested and so on. Once upon a time, Australians were braver than that. You know, after all, we were the first country to have female, you know, uh, women, mem uh, women as uh, allowing women as members of parliament. We, Hare Clark, which was in, been in Tasmania for a long time, that was a pioneering thing. We embraced new ideas. We think of ourselves as bra embracing new technology and mm -hmm. so on. But in the world of ideas, we're totally, as a people, we're totally fearful. So if it hasn't been tested, Are we? well, I, I yeah. just wonder, Lexi, actually, whether it's something, whether there's something else again, again going on too. And I find this from my own experience. I mean, you probably do, Cam. Like people are so busy in their lives mm. trying to um, get their families to sport, um, get themselves an income, do all those other things. They have scarcely got any mm. time now. I would be interested to know, uh, to have some reflection from you about that, Richard, to see if, if life has changed, if capitalism has just got us on a treadmill so much that we are, are kind of, um, we're disempowering ourselves. Uh, how, how was it way back when you started? Well, it was easier. <laughs> <laughs> when we got off the ark, yeah. when, 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 the, when the water had subsided and we all walked off the ark, two of us, myself and my wife, walked off representing humanity. Uh, it was a long time ago, but yeah, that was how it was Sorry. then. And, and the giraffes were right behind us, making us feel very small indeed. Um, yeah, no, no, that was a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> Look, look, we've had modern examples of engagement. Hell, I, I like a lot of people, was opposed to the, the so-called postal survey on, mm. on marriage. But people got engaged in that issue. And, I, you know, in retrospect, I realised I shouldn't have been quite as fearful about it. It actually turned out to be terrific because even... I mean, there's an example of how a referendum-ish mm. kind of thing can work because actually the funny thing about uh, same-sex marriage is if that had been a passed in Parliament through all the jockeying mm. and getting people, it wouldn't have had the power that it had through was was a Mickey Mouse postal survey. But the funny thing is that the people who were opposed to it, once it was over, they accepted and they do mm. accept 
that's it. We're yeah. not going back. It's not like one of these things that, like, some other thing that's passed through Parliament, but next time there'll be an election, another party will be in and will change it around. No, no, that's for keeps. That's for mm -hmm. keeps, because whatever percentage, 60, 65%, whatever it was, mm -hmm. of the people vote surveyed. So we see that people can get... They now can get engaged in individual issues. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, with Me Tooismism, that's an mm. individual issue. But but that we can't pull it together in because we're being asked to tick by by voting for one party. We're being asked to vote for the lot and and piss off for three years and, and ask us again in three years' time. And we'll look after we'll look after you from from here on in. Mm. But an individual issue, I think people are very, despite what you're saying, I know how engaged, the importance of the economic issues of today, but people can get engaged, mm -hmm. and they are, but yeah. they're not showing their engagement through political parties. They're, they're responding to the issues that are really important to online. them. Online. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they can respond online. Yeah, that's good. Cam, is that with enough? your, yep. sorry, but just, I want to hear about, I mean, with Friends of the Earth, you're a member-based organisation. Yep. You've got a very active yep. membership. So moving more to now about, I suppose, models that are working, mm -hmm. that do activate people and encourage people to get involved with decision-making and budgeting, yep. how does that... You know, how does that work for your organisation? Well, probably to pick up on the atomisation and the disengagement thing, I think if we're talking about political processes, they occur in a culture. And the, the culture that we live in, it's clearly not working for a lot of people. Mm. So that actually makes me feel really hopeful because mm. um, it can go either way. It can go to, you know, fear and right-wing populism and xenophobia or it can go to something else. And I guess my experience of working in communities is there's really deep disengagement, but there's also a loss of faith in traditional institutions, mm. be it the churches over mm. sexual abuse. In the, the, the uh, Gasfield campaign we ran, it was around disappointment at the nationals because they weren't back in communities and the farmers' federation. And so it was like, well, in those points where the, the bedrock of your community has failed you, what do you do? One option is you become cynical and disengage and go, it's too hard, why bother? The other option is you engage in community and that's actually where I see the hope is those people who engage locally and I'm really intrigued by this idea of how do we come up with a better system mm. um, but the reality is when you look at those basic things, particularly security of work, particularly older people, their kids, you know, like a lot of older people have spent a lot of years in a job and that's not the reality of millennials. You know, mm. people have to rotate through jobs. There's incredible insecurity. Our infrastructure is just... We have such good systems here compared to a lot of the world and yet they're, they're just at bursting point. Um, I just helped a friend apply for the old age pension and I could not believe how hard it was to actually talk mm. to a human being at Centrelink. Like, it was astonishing. <laughs> not supposed to. Yeah, I know. Um, so we have these great systems, uh, social support systems and we also have very good infrastructure and they've not kept up with the growth yeah. that's happening so that lack of belief in the institutions that should back us and the, the physical structure that should provide for us in difficult times is is no longer fit for purpose and the great hope i see is people are saying neoliberalism has failed even if they don't use that model the electoral system has failed us because it's just two big mobs fighting each other and a couple of smaller groups moving around the outside. But people are engaging in community and that's actually where I find a lot of hope. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, Cam. What about you, Jen? Tell us a little bit about well, Newstead. Well, I guess, and... I guess um, in Newstead we've done that mm. to some degree, although I, I was reflecting on it today. Um, we started back in 2008, and people might remember when Kevin Rudd had his summit and invited a thousand people from around Australia and not the usual suspects. And um, I actually got along to that event, and people were really optimistic at that point, and came home, and we then we said, let's have one in Newstead. We're going to call ours. Uh, uh, our summit, uh, 2021 summit, and so we did. And out of that, the community came along and it seemed, when I think about it, it just seemed like there was um, a meeting of minds. There were a whole lot of people who, were, who had arrived, I guess hadn't been there that long, and they were interested in the community. There were people who'd been there a long time who were also interested, and we went out of our way to acknowledge our elders and what they'd done to create community there, and that was really, really important. Mm. We also had the kids involved from the school. So we had a summit, and people identified uh, things that they were really keen on, and then they just went out and did them. So it's kind of like a... a I think it's actually more a project-oriented 
uh, concept. I've been thinking about this because I've spoken about it with Nikki. And so people went and did a lot of things. And one of the things that they started a community garden, we've got the arts hub going, um, we changed the playground and mm. all the things that were important to people to help make the place a better place to live. And that, that summit, energy was identified. And so we've been going since then on a project to bring renewable energy to Newstead. And I guess I've, I've been uh, skimming through your book, Richard, and, I, and one of the things you talk about is having um, representatives, if, if you like, who get the number of votes mm -hmm. uh, from the number of people who... That they actually represent. Yeah, yeah. that they actually mm. represent. And I suppose we, at that summit, had that, and people sort of gave us social licence, and we keep going back to the community mm. and saying, OK, we've done this now, we're, and we're planning to do this, what do you think? And people say, yep, that's good, keep going. But like anything, you know, there's a small number of people, like you're all involved in organisations yeah. and the sustainability of that is questionable. So I was interested in your idea about actually how you pay people through that process um, in a way that avoids corruption. In the process that I've advocated in yes, the book. Yes, well, but, I, I, but I, would I would say it's been a... I think, Cam, I wouldn't have been able to have that experience mm -hmm. in a much bigger community. Yeah, true. Yeah. Mm. Because we're all kind of, you know, it's small and it, we need to do something to make it work. So mm. that's mm. what gave us, you know... Certainly. I, with our gas field free organising model, towns above 3,000 people got hard. So there was a clear scale where it worked very well. Yeah. 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 So the way we've done things perhaps wouldn't even work mm. in Castlemaine. Yeah, maybe. Mm. Yeah. Well, of course, been, and people have to feel that they're doing... Uh, to, ke to keep on giving their time and their optimism to a mm. project, they have to believe that it isn't futile. Yeah. Mm. Um, and, and, and we do live in an impatient age. Yeah. I mean, the, tr the trouble is that I suppose why I'm so optimistic is I have seen so much... I, I have lived long enough to see a lot of change. Mm. Um, and I know how long change takes. It doesn't happen overnight. Mm. And you have to be patient and you have to work at it. But it is true that people have to see some, some change happening. Or conversely, they have to be so angry about the world that they're living in or so anxious that this is going to fail to deliver anything um, that they're forced, they realise that unless they take action... I think that's where we're getting to. I think people are very uh, anxious about whether um, our, our, our country is going to make decisions that we can be proud of. At the moment, we seem to be making lots of decisions that a lot of people don't feel very proud of, and I think that does uh, does activate people. Um, and you've, you've, you've got to say there has to be a sense that this is not a futile exercise, mm -hmm. and that's why I think mm -hmm. reminding people that other other countries are doing the same thing. The, uh, a lot of, including my own folk, <laughs> came came to Australia from Ireland. Ireland has re revamped its constitution, changed its structures and so on. If the old world can do it, why can't the new world? Mm -hmm. and, and so I think, but I think in a way, it's because we're ignorant of what's going on in the world. We're ignorant of what's, as I say, the New Zealanders did have a, 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 um, a referendum in, in recent times to double check that people were happy with the changes they had made 20 years ago whenever it was they brought in MMR and everyone was really happy. So, but I don't think here we, we understand this, that there are a lot of changes going on in the world that, uh, you know... It, what it, are some models? I mean, there's sort of things that are going on around Australia like citizens, juries, councils, getting everyone together to do planning, to do participatory budgeting. If we're talking about towns bigger than 500 or, or 3,000, what are some things that happen from the ground up that you know any of you are finding effective or you think might work for larger towns? Well, certainly the, the, the people, the, the idea of having panels, that's certainly, and that's being pushed by the New Democracy Foundation mm. and, and I'm very much in touch with them. They themselves are very active. The new, uh, I've, I've attended in recent times to um, very big uh, symposia. They had one in Sydney and one in Melbourne where mm. a, whole lot of, a whole lot of people um, came together. It was, it was pretty elitist. Most of the people there were uh, <laughs> you know, representing organisations and so on, but they were people who were interested in change. And, of course, enormous diversity. 
see. I mean, some people obviously who are come people who are frustrated public servants, you know, are advocating things like that. You know, we shouldn't have anything without a white paper and all that kind of stuff. I I, I listen with amusement to all that, but but that's all right. That's a belief. Uh, I'm you know in my in my father's house there are many mansions as far as I'm concerned, but um, but certainly uh, in some parts of Australia, um, certainly councils. So when they're confronted when they're confronted with some issue that isn't too politicised, but where there definitely are two points of view, the idea of selecting a group of people by random, mm -hmm. with the technical word is sortition, uh, and to, to to draw names out of a hat, and just like we, we just like we used to in criminal jury, we pull names out of a hat and 12 people decide on the facts of a case, then the answer is, why don't we, when there's some bigger issue, pull 100 names out of the hat and fill them up with facts and, and believe that they will come to a sensible decision. Um, and that works. But, of course, it doesn't lead to a government changes in government. I mean, what we're talking about, uh, what I'm talking about, are major, major changes because I, think, I don't think anything less than that. And, and I, certainly in my thinking, I'm very, I'm um, committed to the idea of getting more people engaged with mm. political ideas and certainly why I don't like the juries myself is it seems to me that's like a little bit like contracting out. It's sort of saying none of us need to know anything about it. We'll select 100 people, they can make the mind up and, none, and all the rest of us don't have any views at all as long as, we're, as, long as we've got 100 people true um, I don't like that idea because I'm also media and I want, I think part of the reason why we, our newspapers and, and current affairs and everything, journalism is such a rotten state is people, because people aren't, aren't engaged, they're not interested in the journalism, they're not interested in actually unearthing the facts that help you understand what's going on. What about direct democracy allowing or liquid democracy, allowing people to either get engaged issue by issue? Or liquid democracy, where you can actually, you know, yeah, well, defer well, your mean, votes that, to. I mean, everyone knows what Switzerland does. I mean, they obviously have a lot of referendum. And some parts of America, Oregon is using uh, a regular um, um, a referenda, what we call plebiscit, um, and that's. Uh, I mean, that works. I again, I. Um, I think that's useful. I think it's a step forward, but it doesn't give us. I mean, the truth is, we actually do need an integrated. We do need integrated ideas and fa and uh, coming back to the juries. Not everything's factual. Some things do weigh. We, we each of us has our own moral values. We don't. I'm not a Christian or anything or a religious person, but we all have moral values, and and therefore um, we, there does need to be debate, and that's why uh, I don't. I'm not a particular. The, the idea, well, a referendum as with the same sex marriage where there's been substantial debate and then you're picking up a plebiscite or a survey on the back of that that's terrific and as mm. I say in a way that I think that, that really should get us in a way I think we should see that and pat ourselves on the back and say that worked we got some a serious piece of change there not and as I've said not merely a piece of change meaning mm. the acceptance of same-sex marriage but a permanent thing because it because it even the people who voted against it have accepted that they're in a minority and and therefore it goes forward so we should see that ourselves as a piece as that is the most important piece of social experimentation and that it worked and we should be building on that and saying well if we could do that for that why don't we do that more often for certain kinds of issues. No, you go. Uh, um, well, there's two things there, Richard. What about the uh, experience of people who found that really difficult? Mm. Because you know, of the abuse. Because of the abuse, so there was that. Yeah. And the other thing is, do we have a... So we really, Parliament abdicated its responsibility. Mm. Mm. Yeah, but I'm in favour of that because I don't think Parliament's... A, so I, because I don't believe Parliament's reflecting what people actually want. I mean, here's, a, here's this yeah. argument. Here's this, I, I actually live in the electorate in Australia that was most in favour of same-sex marriage. Yeah. And who is our local member? A man Malcolm. called Malcolm Turnbull. Mm -hmm. Did he represent us? No, he didn't. Mm -hmm. he, he's sitting there. I think more than 80% of people in his electorate actually wanted this change and he wasn't prepared to himself personally... <laughs> vote that through in Parliament. So, so, so they abdicated. So do we get rid of parties then? Well, I would like to, yes. I, then, no, 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 not, uh, not parties. I think parties are really <laughs> important. I think parties have an important role to play in terms of bringing ideas forward. What I'm, in my book, I, I say we've got to decouple, uncouple, um, uh, the idea of putting our political ideas into the 
into the melting pot and representation. Representation, you've got to mathematically represent what people want. In, in our own system, we have this crazy idea that because you belong to a party, you're not responsible to the people in your, the constituents of your electorate. That's, a, that's not democracy at all. In theory, the person is coming back to Malcolm, Malcolm's my local member, his, his electorate on this issue was quite clearly what they wanted. He wasn't prepared to represent that because of what he saw himself as a member of a party that had a different view. Mm. So that's not, that's not, that's and not democracy. And we can't wait around to tip him out next time around. Oh, well, I'm sure if you hang around long enough, he will get tipped. <laughs> <laughs> my tip is he will get tipped. But, uh, <laughs> but you also, excuse me, Lexi, but you also talked about, um, I just would like you to explain a little bit about what you said in your book about um, having representatives and then advocates and how that would work. Right, okay. Can, well, can I give a little summary of, I know most people won't have read the book, so let me just say, what, what I've advocated is, uh, let me talk about representation then talk about how bills thing, but how, how bills come before parliament. But the idea is that I want, I want the members of parliament to truly represent the people that put them up, which is not what's happening. That's why I don't think we're actually living in a... I think we're living in a pseudo-democracy. You're living in a pseudo-democracy if you think your members of parliament are actually representing anything else other than the interests of their own party rather than the interests of the people who voted for them. And, the, and what I've re recommended is that... I, I think, I feel, and this is a radical part of it, that elections are part of the problem, they're expensive, and we don't need them. Elections go half back to a time when we were all very private, for, for very good reason, about our political views. We didn't talk about our pol politics over the barbecues, we were very secretive. We don't need that. Most people are quite happy to talk about and tell you what their political views are, maybe tell you to death what their political views are, so that we've gone past that. So I've gone back to, some people who are maybe shareholders or belong to an owner's corporation in a building know that you have meetings where people go and some of them carry proxies. And the, and the concept is that Parliament should be full of people who, who are carrying the proxies. They're, they're not elected, they're actually there representing these people, 50,000 people or whatever. And their vote is mathematically the number of people that they're representing. They know the names of the people that actually they represent, and, and the people that they represent know their names, so they can actually talk to each other hourly, daily, weekly, whatever, whatever they want to do. Um, but of course, some people, of course, do want to remain uh, uh, private and, and secret, and so some, there are some elections because that's, that's necessary for people who want to be secretive about their politics. But the people in Parliament are either... Rep their votes are equal, whether they're voted uh, in, a, in, a, in an electorate, as I'm representing what... Uh, of advocating what I call a modified Herr Clark, meaning you have electorates of about 200,000 people in which there are three people elected, and those people don't each have one vote in Parliament. They, rep they go to Parliament carrying the number of vote, primary votes they got within the within the electorate. So the votes today, there's 150 members of the House of Reps and, and, and legislation mainly gets passed at 76, 74. Um, but in this system, um, the vote would be 9,382,000 and against 6,432,000, <laughs> representing actually the number of people who are for and against it. But, but the people who are sitting there in Parliament are doing nothing more than representing. They're not speaking on legislation. Legislation, without going too deeply into how that happens, the legislation comes up. The people who speak on it are outside experts. They talk, and the representatives, after, dis after discussing with the people that have put them there, um, vote on it. They're people who listen, and they're not people who, with ambition to become prime minister or, mini or ministers. The prime minister and the ministers, as in America, are not members of parliament at all. They're drawn from the best people. The, the, the minister for health is probably someone who's a professional health professional. We don't. We very rarely have a treasurer who has any grounding in economics whatsoever. It's very rare to have that. Uh, so we actually would need, to, basically, you can imagine the heads of, of the departments today would be like the ministers. They're actually running the health department, running the uh, treasury or whatever. Mm. Um, and so, so the members of parliament, don't. their only ambition is to represent as, truth, as faithfully as possible the people who have actually put them there. That's their sole purpose. They don't have to worry about the party. But I still oh. believe in parties. I think parties should be advocating, mm. um, you know, uh, advocating policies and so on and putting those policies up and trying to get legislation before the parliament 
and, and trying to get people that they think to support that and so on. But we're not, we're not, we're, at the moment, we have this confusion between advocacy and representation. And, and, and advocacy is winning because the, our parliamentarians aren't representing anything very much, but they are advocating things, but they're advocating a whole slate of things, and people are forced into ticking one box or the other, I'm generalising, and basically, um, I mean, it's just crazy. I mean, the Tasmania election, they voted in Hodgman, but actually when you take a poll, you find that most Tasmanians actually want reform of the poker machines. <laughs> that's, that's what they want. Mm. So some of those people vote for him because they Jen, think he's a competent, Jen. and he is a competent politician. What do you, I mean, in terms of the role of special interest groups and lobbying and advocacy, how in society when it's working well, what would, you know, what would that look like? Uh, a democracy is only as strong as the civil society that exists in it. So it's interesting at present we've got a government that's trying to kill off the charity sector. Mm -hmm. they, you know, the, Jazz, the Joint Standing Committee report will surface sometime next week and that'll attempt to basically take away the money from the charity sector and that's everything from the Fred Hollows Foundation to Greenpeace and Get Up. Um, you know, so mm -hmm. if you gut the ability of civil society to have active voices, then you don't have a healthy democracy. And that would be a terrible thing because it really would bring us back to a situation where you do have Labor on one side, Liberals on the other side. Business would find a way mm. still to have input because I think I'm really interested. I'd love to hear you talk about how we would get your system up. And I think you talk about maybe test, trying it yeah, in I South Australia or Tassie. I think the only way it's accept it is by, by doing it on a, on a state basis. I, 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 an electorate like the ACT, yep. which is very small and controllable, yep. could, could adopt this. They have the Hare Clark system already. They could adopt it and see how it works and see mm. whether there's problems, whether there's... Key, normally, with anything you advocate, it's not 100% perfect and therefore you've got to play around with it. And, and I think that if we had one... We only need one brave state or one mm. brave territory to try it out. Mm. No one's going to get killed in this... You know, animals will not die in this experiment. Um, <laughs> and uh, try it out. <laughs> and uh, if it works, people say... And, and that's, of course, how reform... I mean, coming back mm. to uh, the vote for women and women in Parliament, mm. that's how it began. South Australia brought that in in, the I think, the 1880s. And slowly, I might say Victoria was the last state, mm. um, but over a period of 20 years, states said, oh, apparently the world doesn't end because women have a vote, uh, maybe we should be doing this too. So they slowly mm. do that. And, and I mean, that's Can we get how the started at a works. smaller level? Like what, you know, yeah, people here want to get... There you go. <laughs> or even, I mean, uh, would you apply that to local government? And the other thing I wanted to ask you also, Richard, in under that system, what would stop... Uh, the same sort of lobbyist thing. Let's say there's a really big issue that comes up, a, a really big bit of legislation, and powerful um, sectors put up candidates who just go and do all their campaigning and get people to say, yes, we support that one. Like, how are you going to avoid the same thing that already happened? Well, people mm. are going to... I mean. People in choosing who they want as, the, as their representative, some of them are going to... In the end, it's going to be, t in a way, it's going to be a test of what is the most important thing for you. If you're living in Castle, Maine, it may turn out the most important thing for you is to have someone who's responsive to uh, a small, pro a small provincial, uh, regional city. Mm. Okay, or you might say I'm a woman, and I actually want somebody who's representing women. Mm. Or I might have a disability and I want somebody who represents... That might be the most important thing for mm. me. I want a representative who's really hot on that issue or whatever. I mean, ideally, you might want someone who's very keen about regional and disability and women, whatever. Mm. But, but it, it sorts that out. Now, vested interests can... They're just like uh, Hansonites or Greenies or whatever. Uh, there, there's, no, there's nothing to be... Fr because, in fact, there's no such thing as the balance of power in my system. They're entitled to... If they can find... If if, uh, if the mining industry has... If, if all the miners of Australia, all the people who are in the under working under, all want to vote for a particular candidate, that's fine. I mean, yeah, that's their democratic right. and they, they would. But they're only representing... 200,000, less than that these days, people in, a, in an electorate of 16 million. But won't they still be using the same sorts of things like fake news, mm. um, 
all those sorts of false advertising, um, all that sort of thing to muster support. But the thing is that if you know, if you're a representative and you know who's voted for you, and those people are really important to you because actually you're hoping to have a long career representing. You know, it's not like you're up for re-election. You're hoping that they're not going because they're entitled to resign, to sack you, and go to another representative at any time. So if you're going to keep them. Uh, I mean, you're going to be in contact with them and you're going to create a relationship with them just like a political party does today. So, so y you can trump that false news because these are the people that have actually put their name to you. They're, you're representing them. The, 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 the representative is able to talk back and say, look, on this one I'm proposing that I'm going to vote this way. What do you guys guys and gals, what do you guys think should be doing? So I think that, sure, people can try disinformation, but I think it's possible to get p past that through people's loyalty and belief in the Cathy McGowan's of the world. You know, it's, because when, when you actually know and you, have, and you have faith in your representative, because they really are representing, they're not just somebody, they're representing you, mm. I think you're going to listen to them very much, very hard, much harder. And I think they have an opportunity of talking to you and saying, I've seen that stuff that the miners or the whatever are put out, but that's bullshit and this is the reason. And I think you have a, a, a way of com combating it. At the moment, you don't have that. It, the, 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 there's no relationship between the electorate and their representatives, except that once every three years they're supposed to trot out and dot either that one or that one. And you're saying, actually, we don't have elections, so it's when... Um, when well, not the, for the people. Your, your voters, your the, the twenty votes that you've got. Yeah, yeah. And they say, "Oh, I don't like what you're doing anymore. You're out. We're going to get someone else." That's right, and so that it can happen anytime. And that, of course, affects their income because they. Well, I should say that a person can only be a member uh, can only be a member of parliament if they have five, represent five thousand people, but they only get on the payroll if they represent fifty thousand people. <laughs> So they mm -hmm. and they only go to Canberra if they represent fifty thousand people. The, the people who are representing five thousand, six thousand people, are they're starting off their life as a representative and they're working from their own home. They're here hearing uh, Parliament on streaming streaming uh, media, uh, so they can vote from they can op operate from their home. They're not in Parliament. They're not seeing it, but they're hearing it and seeing it on on, on uh, streaming. Um, so it's important to them to represent 50,000 people if they can because that actually puts them on the public purse and puts them and gives them a place in Parliament and, and, and some of the perks that go with that. Mm. So they need to be very on the ball and be representing because, I mean, if they're representing people but lots of the people they're representing are, resi are sacking them and going moving to another representative because they're not happy with the representation. So they're focused entirely on making their people, in a way that <laughs> our reps these days, these aren't because they're saying, God, I, I mm. want to hold on to my people. I still have an issue around, let's take um, agriculture, for example. Yeah, yeah. So in the mm. agriculture sector, there's big ag. Yeah. And they want free trade and all those sorts yep. of things, which boost the economy yeah. and so on and so forth. But there's actually another sector that is very concerned about what that does to um, wages Right. And to actually our capacity to grow things without lots of chemicals and costs and all those sorts of things. So let's say you've got um, 10,000, even 5,000, I don't know how many people are organic farmers, for example, yep. and they're small scale. What hope in hell have they got against, on, on, a, on a farming issue, on a trade issue... When there's twenty because everyone else well because everyone votes on the issue it's not just the farmers and and they yes the organic might only have five thousand and the and the, as you say the the people who are in favour of uh, of um, you know putting Agent Orange <laughs> over yeah. the forests might represent twenty thousand but but that, in the Parliament if, if there's legislation about for example the slashing of trees. Yes. Um, everyone's voting on it. So there's a, there's a rational argument in the parliament in which the people are arguing for both sides why, they should, why we should knock every tree out because that allows for economic farming, blah, blah, blah. We know all the arguments about that, blah, blah. And everyone's voting on it. I mean, why would they... Merely because only 5,000 people are voting for their organic person, that person isn't on their own. If they can persuade all the other people mm -hmm. who have no vested interest, they're not on the land, but, but are listening to this rational debate... Uh, they've got to win that. Mm. And we are going to, we're going to throw to the audience soon, yeah, 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 but I do would like to hear um, first about, from each of your perspectives, about how we get started. For people here who are interested in trialling different models, how do we get started 
at a local level, mm. perhaps at a local council level, what advice would you give to people here who are interested in actually taking some of these ideas and championing them? I think in politics you get what you can afford and you buy things in two ways. One is through money, influence, connection, which is the current mm. status quo of how things are done, and the other one is through organising political power. Mm. And we don't have political power to get a transition of the, of the political system at present. It's just not on the radar. Um, so I think what we do need to do is be very smart and focus where we can federally, where we can state, where we can local, mm. and understand we've actually got to walk and chew gum, that is work on all the levels at the same time. I think here in Castle Maine, the main task is a lot of what influences our community is driven by local government, which operates under a certain set of laws and res is responsible for certain things. And the reaction to government is either people whinging because they don't like them, or kind of putting up ideas, let's have more bike paths or whatever. But there is no vision for our community mm. that's driven by our community. And I think what we need as a starting point is like a watershed council or a community council that shadows the government, mm. that doesn't replace it, but spends enough time that it has a vision what infrastructure do we want? What energy future do we want? What food production do we want? How are we going to, what urban form are we going to have? We need to spend a lot of time thinking about that. There's a very interesting initiative in New South Wales called the Sydney Alliance, mm. which was an attempt to do this for Sydney. They spent a year and a half figuring out how they were going to work together before yeah. they actually came up with a model. So I think that's something we need to do is to have a broad-based citizens council that shadows what the, the local government does, but actually has a vision, not issue by issue, but actually a vision for the future we want to see yeah. for our community. And that should be Thanks, oh, <laughs> that should be open, um, you know, basically to everyone. But it has to be predicated on the fact we do live in the 21st century. We do have climate change. We do have population growth. We do have ecological crisis. So it's not an excuse for every nutcase to come in and argue for <laughs> flat Earth politics. But it's a place where the community, a very broad cross section of the community, can be heard as long as they're prepared to work towards a vision. Um, and not reinvent the wheel because there's already great work being done by community groups in, in our you know, shire area, but that actually has a vision that can then inform what the local council does. Great, thank you. And Cam, well, I have one question around that, Lexi, if you don't yeah, mind, because the, the council does have a, have a plan, doesn't it? It has a four-year yep. plan and it, it asks the community and puts out mm -hmm. a paper. Mm -hmm. Where are the inadequacies in that? I think that the feedback from the community is very sectoral and, and silo orientated. Yeah. And I think that what we do is we respond to, you know, the recreation plan or the infrastructure plan or the, the budget overall, and we don't actually have the ability to have the conversation. We haven't created the space for ourselves as a community of 10,000 people to have that conversation about what will Castle Maine look like in the future. Yeah. We're mm. being buffeted by all these forces. We've got us, all us, you know, latte swilling, blowings coming off the boat from Melbourne. We do have <laughs> climate change is kicking in quite seriously. We're going to have incredible water stress here if you do read any science about what's coming to our region, hotter, drier, worse bushfire seasons. You know, we've got all these imperatives coming down. We have no way as a community to respond to that at present. And the best we can do with local council is, you know, fill out the survey, which isn't, is no slight on, the, on local council because they can't do more than that. I think the ball is in our port, in our court, and we need to actually say that as a model probably made sense in the 1950s, but now the council needs to be the tail on the dog, not actually the, the tail that's, that's wagging the community. What about you, Jen? Well, I think that what it might take is an agreement that there's a problem. So you might have a sector that sets out CAM and begins that work, but unless you get cross-community agreement that there's an issue there, and uh, some way of going forward, mm. I think you're going to struggle with that. There's always, mm. you know, oh, they're the usual mm. suspects yep. and so on. Mm. So um, if that could be done, mm. that, it, yeah, somehow getting acknowledgement that there's a problem. And I think that even nationally, um, that needs to be the situation where the corporates uh, and the people with money acknowledge that we need to do something too. Mm. And I think there are parts of that to do. Um, as for um, my ideas about what could happen locally, um, mm, 
I don't have any great ideas. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to keep doing the work I'm doing in my community. Um, it's very single focused, I suppose. Um, yeah, I don't really have any great ideas. You have lots of great ideas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Richard? Is it going to take a, a republic? Slight, a slightly and... tangential answer, but what I should say to you is this, that before I got involved in this issue, which I have been for the last year, um, I was not aware that in a country like America, there's a network of hundreds and hundreds of little regional groups who are interested in the subject of reforming their democracy. Mm -hmm. they, they too think their democracy isn't working. Um, and we're, through the New Democracy Foundation and the mm. group that I'm working with there, we're trying to create a similar network here. There are a lot of people, both people as individuals and people as groups, who are interested in seeing what, in knowing more about all the different kind, different approaches to mm. changing democracy. And we're trying, we're tr tr going to, uh, go, you know, it's, a, it's low cost, but having having a mailing list, having from, from time to time uh, sending out material. And so uh, I w we're setting that up at the moment, and I will certainly let Cathy and other, the other people who have been involved in, in setting this up tonight know about it. So if there are people here who would like to, you know, know uh, belong to that either as individuals or as groups, then then that possibility is very real. That that's going to ha that is going to happen, and so it's uh, mm -hmm. fortunately there's a lot of uh, people enthusiastic enough to do to set that up. And I think I, because I think it's important that people don't feel that, that we're all alone and no one uh, no one other mm. than the people in this room are caring. <laughs> there are a lot of people, and we're just going to get, get that together so that we know. That, and as I say, it's not pushing one particular barrow. Just knowing the thing where Lots only one people know is there are other ways of doing democracy mm. yeah. in the world and there are a lot of ideas floating around let's have a look at them let's open the window let's let this fresh air in because actually it's very stale in here at the mm. moment and not I, right and I, and, 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 <laughs> and I would say that whatever whatever we do that we should have a set of values that we work mm. with and part of that is respect for people and listening I think yeah. that's really really important thanks Jen well speaking of listening we're going to get some questions from the audience. Nikki's got the microphone there, so look at this. Look at all those hands. So mine, mine's a question addressed to Richard, and you're all welcome to join in as well. And it's about concepts. I think it would be good if you could do a brief description of the hair clerk system as you see it, and then I'd like you to skip forward and place it into a republic, please. Well, the hair clerk system that, that operates at the moment in both Tasmania and ACT is where you have, where you have elect larger electorates than we're used to normally that, that return more than one member, which is the same as, as MMR in, in New Zealand. That, that gives smaller parties a better chance of being represented. It's not a, in a way what we're living in is a winner take all. We have a, a electorates. And the person who gets 50.1% of the of the two party preferred acts as though they're representing everybody. They actually represent. They might have a margin that's as thin as you like, but they're they're the winner. In a hair clerk system, they're representing. They're having. You can have two or three representatives, and so there's a possibility, a bit like more like what we're used to in the Senate where, again, as with the Senate, and that's why, of course, the minor parties get better representation in the Senate, when you, act, when you enlarge the, the, the electorate and allow more um, people to be elected, there's more chance of, of but. But in that system, each person that gets elected, if you have an electorate of, that's returning three people, each just has one vote, even though, of course, each of them will be supported by a, different numbers of people. My modification is, is for people, as I said, for people to cast in the parliament the actual number of votes that they received as either primary or, or, mm. or two-party preferred or whatever is appropriate, mixed in with those people who are actually representing people directly, which I call open uh, electors, who are actually prepared to just say, I'm representing these people. Um, so that's the modification that I've. Uh, that's how Cla how Clark exists, as they and represent in Tasmania and the ACT. Um, but I'm talking about a modification of that. Oh well, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, w what I'm hoping is, I, I'm, I'm actually hoping the Republic comes slowly because I, I think it would be infuriating. It seems to me that one day we will have, I think everyone kind of accepts one day we will have a Republic. It seems to me stupid, given our, our dissatisfaction with what we've got, if you simply took the Governor General and gave him or her a different name, President, and said, oh boy, we've got a Republic here. Um, such a minor change. It seems to me if we're going to one day embrace a republic, and I'm sure we are, let's do it properly. Let's, uh, uh, well, if we don't, let's at least think about what are the, when we're making such a change, instead of making it as min, what we're, to, the, the, we're seem to be thinking, what's the minimum, because we really think it's really important to have a man, a man or a woman called the president, so let's make it as small as possible, small target, so everyone will vote for it, because gosh, we don't want to frighten people, we want them to vote for this thing. I don't really care whether the person who theoretically is the leader of Australia is called the Governor General or the President. I'm much more about if we're going to make change, let's do some significant change that makes our system mm. better. So what I'm saying is when the moment comes, instead of just worrying about what we call it and how, whether it's elected, whether the President is elected by Parliament or by the people, uh, for the record I think it should be by the people, um, then that's a tiny question. There are more important, and that's what I'm hoping, is that people by then will be more aware of all the possibilities and, and let's, not, let's not get cowardly, let's be brave, as brave as we think we are. We are these people who, you know, grasp new technology. Why shouldn't we grasp a new electoral system? <laughs> here, here. <laughs> more questions? Thank you, and um, thanks to Nikki and everyone who's organised the conversation, because mm. I think this is the first thing we need to do. <laughs> and I think that connects with, um, you know, we're starting to talk more about meaning and value, and I think what we're doing in um, rural and regional places all over the world is starting to look at creating our own meaning again and therefore mm. our own value. Mm. And I think as Richard's alluded to, there's lots of things happening around the world that, you know, we're opening up to and we can learn a lot from and, you know, new democracy, but also the new economy, the commons movements. Um, and I think that, you know, what I'm interested in the comment from um, everyone, Cam, Jen and Richard, is... Um, in terms of the influence of the nation state and how it has increasingly become really a tool of neoliberal capitalism and how we look at that influence and in controlling our, our government systems. And particularly about confederated democracy then, the idea of, you know, if you look at it, we've got local government, state and federal all totally disconnected in a sense. But logically, you, we would vote for our local representatives who would then go to the next level and the next level, which is, um, the principle of confederated democracy and nationless states so that we're not actually driven for what we do by being a nation but being a conglomeration of small municipalities having influence. And I just wanted one final comment, I'm not sure how many people are aware, but there's been an example in the world happening in northern Syria of confederated democracy mm. and of course it's been blown to bits and mm. the world sits mm. and watches and hardly anyone knows and mm. but you know and, and and essentially a feminist revolution happening there and I mean that's hopeful and the, the last bit too is places like Spain Barcelona where communities negotiate with local government and say we want to use this space for this purpose and um, have written local government legislation to enforce that and so it can happen mm. but mm. thank you very much for your input mm. any comment to that Mm. Well, um, I think if, if what you're talking about is actually the community taking responsibility and saying, um, actually, we've, we, this is what we want, this is our vision, and then going um, to their representatives, is that what you mean? And then them taking it further up the, up the line? I'm not sure that I understand what you mean by... Well, it's really more about the, the decisions. We've given away so much to the nation concept and <laughs> but we start to decide that we want to make decisions locally. We can start with one thing. Yeah. But then and we also then change our representation. Because mm. I think as Richard is saying, we need to build our representation from when we all agree, two people, three, ten, twenty, mm. okay, here's a voice. Then mm. we can say this is our voice. 
Mm. And someone represents it. It'll take time. It's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of hope and a lot of models. I th mm. Well, actually, I think it's happening in energy because if you look around at the phenomenal number of very small community groups that have formed around energy, mm. it's it's really, really impressive. And mm. again, um, I, I don't like to talk her up too much, but Cathy McGowan has actually put out a, a now a policy saying my, my electorate is going to be 100% mm. renewable mm. Mm. Yeah. because so many small community groups in her electorate said this is what we want. Thank you. I think we have a question up the back there. So how can we, how can we really make a better political system that deals with um, corruption? Thank you. We don't need to change the system. The problem is because we live in this political duopoly, neither, political, neither of the major political parties actually want to stamp corruption out because they realise they're both actually corrupt. <laughs> um, I, mean, the, the, sadly for, I mean, sadly, I mean, I think that um, one of the areas where my book's slightly out of date, uh, for a long time, I mean, everyone, everyone said what a great idea would be to have a federal ICAC. Um, the... the, the, the coalition is definitely opposed to that and Labor for a long time shortened was simply saying we would like to look into it we're, we're taking it very seriously I think he's actually now advocating it because he realizes there's, there's really some big votes uh, involved in saying that but the parties I mean given their own given their own, their uh, free will they wouldn't be in favor of it because as I say unfortunately politics is really rotten but you don't have to change the system we we, we need uh, decent, poli decent police, and I don't mean necessarily policemen, but, but ICACs and so on that actually ha have the power and the um, f resources. I mean, one of the problems that's coming out yet again with the, the um, Banking Royal Commission is, you know, the uh, Turnbull and his people said, oh, there's no need because, uh, you know, ASIC is so strong at it's basically handling all this. No, it isn't. And ASIC is so poorly resourced that it can barely f fight a few law cases a year because it doesn't have the money. The ATO, I mean, we all know, I'm sure, um, that there's enormous rorting, people not paying GST, people on, on, uh, uh, on, on um, you know, not paying proper tax, not paying proper taxes. What's happened? That's because actually the number of people on the ATO payroll in the last five years has gone down. We have about, I think from memory, about half as many people actually um, uh, supervising, <laughs> making people pay their taxes. So we don't need the system. We just need, we need governments that are actually, um, who are committed um, to, to making sure the, the stuff isn't rorted. But as well as that, of course, we need rules that actually mean for the... We, there is no reason why we shouldn't now... For, to, let's take the Tasmanian election. Apparently, I think it's going to take two years to find out. We all actually know there was a lot of money put behind the Hodgman government. We, we suspect it might be, the, <laughs> might be the poker machine industry that put a lot of money in. Um, but we won't know for two years. You need to be in a situation... That, and in this day and age, you should know within 24 hours when someone's given a donation to a party, who they mm. are, how much they've given. I mean, that's not hard stuff, but, it's, mm. but there's no political will. No political will. Thank you. Um, this question for uh, Richard. Recent months you were part of a uh, symposium on trusted long-term decision-making. Mm. And one of the recommendations um, was to trial a standing citizen's chamber um, by way of circuit breaking, all this adversarial politicking. Um, how would that work on a local government level? Well, we think, we think that the, the, thing is, the thing that we might be able to get, uh, we, we, to be honest with you, I, we, uh, uh, when we had that, we thought that Xenophon was going to do a little bit better in South Australia than it turned out. We thought that a lot of electoral reform in Australia has come about when independents have had a balance of power for a period of time. And certainly in New South Wales, there was a time when, uh, um, when, some, when the independents did and they were able to drive through some changes that were the benefit of independent uh, parties. That, that was part. And you'll remember that when Tony Windsor and um, Robert Oakeshott joined the 
agreed to support the Gillard government. They brought in some changes. They weren't major changes, but they were changes that affected, made, made the independence life easier and more effective. And so that's always been a case. And the softest option is to convince someone somewhere along the line to simply have a, just like uh, the summit, you know, it's just a different word for a summit, a summit that actually where we draw together a whole lot of people and look at the different things that are possible and what advantages they might have to, if it was in South Australia, what advantages, and certainly Xenophon, if he had been in a balance of power situation, did want some electoral reform, not as far as radical as I would like. Um, so so we, we kind of feel that sooner or later, um, there will be a situation where, where a government is trying to persuade uh, minor parties or independents, they will need them to come on board and they will be in a position to negotiate and at least set up what we call a people's assembly, that meaning a, a, a large, what we used to in the Hawke era call a summit, um, where you bring together people and explore what are the different possibilities of change and what are the advantages and disadvantages and so on. By ventilating that, I think it gives a legitimacy to the question which we're talking about tonight. Is there a better way? Is, there, is, this, is this the best there is? I doubt it. And so, so the idea is to, in, in one of the, uh, but that hasn't occurred. I mean, both in the, in the most recent uh, state elections, both in Tasmania and South Australia, of course, uh, the governments, uh, the, the, the new government in the case of South Australia and the old government in the case of Tasmania have a clear majority and they, they're under no pressure to change their electoral system. But the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away and I'm sure it'll happen and I'm sure if we all, I, I always say I look after my health because I'm going to, damned if I'm not going to stay alive long, I'm going to stay alive until this change. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we heard it first As best year. I can. <laughs> So I'm going to put a, a question to whoever wants to answer it, and that is, um, coming back to the question of values, isn't the more important thing to look at what it is that we want, as you said, Cam? You know, what, what, what is our vision? Uh, would anyone like to comment? <laughs> I, I think we all would. Um, look, I agree with you, and I think the, electro the ideal or the best electoral system we might adopt is secondary to the culture we want to live in and the society we want to live in and that's and I know that's not the subject of tonight we're talking about alternative electoral systems but I just feel that you know a lot has happened since the 1980s and this assumption that endless growth and market-based systems will continue to deliver the goods for most people clearly is failing and there's been a profound shift in the last couple of years where it's no longer the people selling Green Left Weekly who say that, it's actually everyone that understands that that is what is going on. The system is failing us as individuals and as a community and as a nation. And the beautiful dilemma we face is that as yet no one has put forward a coherent alternative vision. And that's the absolute nub of our problem at present. There is no you know, third way that has been suggested that actually has traction, that appears doable with the political and cultural realities we have in Australia, and that the, that's really where the real work is, to my mind. We've got to keep working around the issues, be it refugees or environment or climate or suggesting different electoral systems, but we actually need, a, you know, a model that's going to be more coherent than something nicer than capitalism, and really we don't have much that's on offer at present in the public realm. Mm. It is, but it's the next conversation. I think how we vote is one thing, but the, the key conversation, the, the next deep conversation is what would that look like? How would economics work? How would we govern the market? How would we plan for how markets would work? So it's actually an economic conversation, um, economic values conversation, as well as the very important what electoral system would run that system. But yeah, it's a little bit like we're, we've got to design the, the boat first before we talk about how we're going to steer it. Can I, can I be a naysayer here? It is, is all very well for us in this room, we probably all share similar values, to agree on that and then to say that's more important than the process. You aren't... We are, for better or for worse, going to live in some kind of democracy, whether it's the imperfect democracy we have now or some future democracy. 
if we aren't able to carry everybody and persuade them to our values, it doesn't matter how pure we feel in our own hearts, if, we, if we're living in a society with other people who don't share those values and they mathematically have more people than we do, then our values aren't going to work. You've got to have the process because the process involves everyone and allows the allows the values you're talking about as a kind of marinade. It's going to marinade the system <laughs> and, and carry people with it. And, and uh, coming back to, to Vietnam, you start off with, a values, with values that may be in a minority, but the only way... You, you can't just stand on the moral high ground and feel good about yourself. You've got to actually persuade people, and you've got to have enough faith that what you believe in, yeah. that you're capable of persuading people who don't necessarily come from the same background, socioeconomic, educational background yourself, that you can. And I believe you can. I really believe you can. And, but, and, but, and, but we've got to set a system up that allows the kind of contact between the political leadership, where people have faith in the leadership, in the, not leadership, the representation, and that we have the means, the, the interaction between representation and the people who are being represented, that is the only way we can carry our values forth. It is, it, it, I'm, I mean, obviously we all share, but that, I think, is... The, to say that the process is kind of like down here and we, all, all we've got to do is work on the ideas, I, I, don't, I think both things have to be worked on, but it is, it, the process is not as simple as you make it out. It's very difficult, obviously, to make change. But the change is really important because it's only through that that we're going to get a proper dialogue going with people. And, and, if, and I think we've got to believe that our values are so good that we can persuade people who, even, if, even in some cases where it's against their economic interest, mm -hmm. but they understand that it's important because they it may not be in my, in my economic interest, but I understand that what I'm, uh, the change I'm wanting, and a lot of things I believe in aren't in my economic interest, but I support them because they're in the interest of my children and my grandchildren and, and so on. And I understand we're human beings. And, 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 and while, again, Coming back to another question, I mean, I, I think at times we belong to little communities, and I understand the growth of nationalism in, in, in Spain and wherever, Basques and, and so on. Um, but on the other hand, we've, the, we've, all that has to be overwhelmed by the sense that we're all humanity and we all belong. We've got to have both at the same time a sense of belonging to a community and a sense of belonging to the world, yeah. and, and that we're prepared to both enjoy the community we're in but also, and we must never give up in, in believing that we can persuade the world and the people around us and the people who don't seem like us that they can share our values if we can get close enough to them, talk to them in their language and, 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 and get rid of, of much of the, sh the shit that's getting, <laughs> to coin a technical phrase, get rid of the shit. <laughs> <laughs> I just, um, actually, I just had an experience of that this week. So we're right at the point we've got a company interested in building a solar park in Newstead. But this company is a renewable energy company and it can give us just, it can just go out and buy green power or it can give us batteries and um, solar panels on people's individual roofs. Or if we actually have a solar park, it's a, it's the, the benefit is greater for the greater collective mm. because everybody can afford it. Uh, you know, it's, it's available to anybody, whether they're rich or poor or whether their roof goes this way or that way or it's flat or angled. And I've been sitting in households with people talking about that this week. It's really, really interesting um, what happens because you do have to do exactly that, Richard. And, and we and should take heart difficult. from the fact we should take heart from the fact in the last decade how much how much of Australia has been, now been swept up. I don't hear very many many people out there in the pubs talking as though there's no climate problem. <laughs> it, it has seeped down. It has seeped down. But it's not taken a minute or a month. Mm. But in a decade, we've moved from that being a kind of crazy. Mm greedy, way out idea to basically mainstream. Um, Localising in Yanganook had um, a woman from the Australian Earth Laws Alliance come and speak. And um, I guess I'm really aware of how much of our um, democracy and our political system is very human centric. So just be interested in your comments of um, what they're trying to do is to make sure that the voice of the earth and the voice of biodiversity is part of the conversation and make sure that there's a space for them at the table. So I'd just be interested in your comments on that and whether there are any models of democracy in the world where the earth is actually at the table. 
The ones I'm aware of that are very powerful are the watershed council concepts, which are based on the idea of bioregionalism, which is that we live in a real place. We don't just live in Australia or in the biosphere. We live in central Victoria or the goldfields. I think they've got really interesting models because in addition to, say, bringing the community together, so we might be Castle Maine and we might talk about the issues that matter to us, there'll also be people who are tasked to present ecological information so that in making those decisions about where we put the houses and how we do our farming and where we produce our electricity from, there are actually people in effect advocating on behalf of you know rivers and landscapes and climate. And I think as a model, that needn't be anything weird and you know kind of unduly spiritual. It's just to say these are also members of our community, these forests, these rivers, these landscapes. Mm. And I think it's a really interesting model. Mm. 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 Watershed councils. Thank you. Um, Richard, you were very positive about uh, direct democracy in the form of plebiscites. Um, but I wanted to ask you, what, what do you do when the plebiscite brings out a lot of undemocratic behaviour? Um, I'm just studying at the moment the centenary of the plebiscites on conscription and there were people with you know fist fights going on in Castle Maine and the churches putting out pamphlets calling each other bigots and all of this and so the last plebiscite that we had on same-sex marriage I would have wished had just gone through Parliament because in Castle Maine it brought out so much bad behaviour and undemocratic behaviour. It's not undemocratic behaviour because they're actually rep such people are representing some a voice within community. I think that, uh, but I mean, we have that, that kind of behaviour, and I can't comment on the, the local thing that you're talking about, but I mean, the vilification uh, of gay community or Aboriginal pe people is we have laws in place and the kinds of behaviour you're talking about can occur at any time, and we either have strong enough vilification laws, I mean, that's a, a whole different argument, and I'm in favour of such laws, um, but they either exist or they don't exist. Now, it's, it's true to say that something like uh, the, the, the um, so-called postal survey did exacerbate, but at the same time, um, uh, at the same time, in a way, the fact that despite all that awful behaviour, Australia overwhelmingly supported it. I mean, I feel as though, in a way, it, it, it has shut those people, that, such people up for life, because what was said is, you had, your, you had your say, and it was terrible, and it was painful, I, I agree. Um, if it's unlawful, if it's unlawful, then they should be prosecuted. If it's not unlawful, and we think maybe we should be changing the law, that's a different thing too. But, but, but as I say, I think in a way we've seen the people who are opposed to same-sex marriage, they've done their worst, and I don't think we're going to hear from much from them again. And I think in a way that's what I mean by I think in a, by doing it this way, and as I say, I was originally opposed to it, but I think in a way it's kind of really strengthened. I feel, and I, 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 I'm not gay myself, so I have many gay friends, and they too feel kind of more confirmed, more, they, they know it was painful, but they feel, many of my friends feel as though their position in late life has been more, more legitimised through going through that ordeal, which actually was an ordeal, but wasn't quite as bad as we all thought it might have been. Um, so, I, I mean, I think, unfortunately, that's part of democracy. We have, we're, at any time, we have to work out how much freedom of speech we allow. That's a, that's a, that's a question in its own right, and it doesn't really matter whether we're having uh, plebiscites or referendum or whatever. We have to have the right balance between freedom of speech and vilification and, uh, our, uh, and, the, and the curtailment of freedom of speech if it becomes abusive. Um, but that's that, that's a different issue. It's not an issue that's it's, it, that's brought that's any greater or lesser extent. With you having a, a survey or a referendum, we either have the right laws or we don't have the right laws. If we don't have the right laws, then we have to have an argument about and and, and perhaps persuade people that we need tighter laws or whatever. Thanks, so we just have to go through the yucky stuff. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Sometimes, mm. sometimes, sometimes. It's that thing of 
accountability and the preparedness to compromise and to hear different voices versus the politics of posturing and the dog whistling. Oh, my God. Yeah. Um, so that really is my question. Sort of like how in a system which is set up for the news bite, do we get consensus in democracy or at least some form of collective voicing? Well, um, guess what? I don't know. <laughs> but I think, um, and I can't, I, in, in being here tonight, I'm not speaking on behalf of the people of Newstead at all. Um, and I would never claim that. I don't think we've got consensus. I think there's still a lot of different views out there about how things should be done. Um, and in fact, when we set about doing the energy project, I was fiercely about addressing climate change and getting emissions down. For me, that was the big, really big goal. But actually, we came across people who said, well, uh, yeah, that's OK. But if you split this community in the process of doing that, it's all over Red Rover. So actually, we have to find common ground. So there were a few people, uh, business minds came along and said they were interested in working because they were interested in, in the community and looking after the community and looking after people they knew down the road who couldn't afford to turn the light on. And we began to think about it and of course, I'm, you know, I really want to do something, mm. but I realise it ain't going to work if it's not mm. if it's not viable and feasible for people mm. to pay their bills. Mm. So we, what we really, what that, what happened then, just by those minds coming together, was actually saying, okay, so how can we do that? How can mm. we meet, get these, reach mm. these goals, and how can we um, also uh, reach the economic goals and work it that way. So that was really fortunate. I don't know whether that model could be expanded into a bigger system. Thanks. One more. Genevieve again. I was most interested to hear you mention that the Newstead Primary School children had input into 2021. Mm. My questions too tonight are, where are the future leaders in Castlemaine, the 18 to 30 year olds tonight? <laughs> I'm just making it. In. Yay, Lexi! No, I'm joking, I'm joking. We've got one. We have one. Any others? <laughs> My, uh, not in proportion to their numbers in the population, <laughs> sorry. But um, my other question is, what do the organisations involved in tonight and other organisations currently here tonight, what are you doing about getting into schools and talking to the young people and getting them early? Mm. Um, somebody else might, out there might like to answer that, this person there, but just before we go on, I know there's a bunch of young kids, like we've got a bunch of kids um, who are in their 20s in Newstead, in their 20s and early 30s, um, who are really interested in this stuff. And I'm, I'm not sure yet, um, Grace, that we've given, or that, that's, that their voices have been enabled to come out and maybe they operate in another way. With the energy project, we're starting to develop a program to take into the school just for the kids to learn how to monitor their energy and things like that. Um, but I do think sometimes the community leadership programs could target specifically, you know, the very young kids in school. And, and of course, then the kids go after school, they go and they go to uni and that's it. Well, I'm going to ask the last question, if that's all right. <laughs> As your um, younger person, it is actually about engaging younger people. So um, I was born the year the Berlin Wall fell, which was also the same year of Tiananmen Square. Mm -hmm. um, and I've grown up probably taking democracy and freedom very much for granted. So what advice would you like to share with people um, who want more from our democratic system but don't really know where to start? Well, I would say to parents and grandparents, stop whinging about it. Stop saying it's crap and stop saying it's this, that, the other thing because that's what the kids are taking in when they're little mm. and actually um, start maybe, I don't know, taking small actions. But I think that's really important. That's one thing. Thanks. Cam? 
when I look at my kids and think how many light years ahead of where I was at their age around understanding the value of diversity, you know, the need to challenge bullying, the, 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 just the remarkable world view they have which has come through their community and through their education, um, I'm in awe that, you know, those changes, those cultural changes are happening. Um, I think that um, we movement in society is often subtle and slow and because it is subtle and slow we don't actually witness it until we can look back on it. Mm. So I actually feel like there has never been a more remarkable generation than the generation that's emerging now and look at the response to the recent massacres in the United States and mm. that movement that just came out of nowhere is driven by you know under under 20 year olds and is is hopefully going to re reshape that country i um yeah i think it's easy to complain and go oh it's not how it should be uh, but it's happening it's just happening differently and that's the reality you know is that each generation will do things a little bit different and we just need to step back and look at the the trajectory of where we're going and it, it actually makes me feel very very hopeful thanks cam yeah Final word. Hmm. I think uh, kids have always been kids. I mean, certainly in, in my, again, going back to my youth, we were, what were the issues? We weren't interested in politics, political parties. We were interested in the struggle for Aboriginal rights. We were interested in the fight against white Australia policy. Mm. We were interested in apartheid in South Africa and we were interested in the Vietnam War. They were all mm. issues. Mm. I, it didn't come together in all those issues. We were opposed to both political parties. Mm. We were very slow to respond to those issues. And I think we're living in the same world. I think that the kids today, from what I can see, I, I say my, my, my grandchildren are adults, um, but from what I can see is they're still interested in issues and I mean they, they many of them became engaged in the same sex uh, uh, marriage and made sure they were enrolled so they could actually have a say mm. and so on so it's not as though they're not in, they're not engaged they're still engaged in issues mm. but like all of us they've thrown up their, their hands in despair at mm. political parties and so they're not, and they're, you know, they're not here tonight because this is about politics. But this is about the bigger, you know, bigger picture. And to some extent, they they prefer, they find it easier to focus on very individual. If this was a specifically on some environmental issue that's local here, I'm sure they'd be much more interested. But when you, you know, it's natural as you get older, you kind of see how the little bits. It's sort of like stepping back from a micro dot picture. You actually see how it all comes together, and and you do see the bigger picture. And uh, but that's how how it's always been and I don't think we should despair about that's the way we, we, we would despair if they weren't interested in the issues but they are they are they, they're involved in get up and all that sort of stuff mm. all right thank you I know we've got a few more questions but I'll invite you to come up later but for now I'm going to wrap it up officially so please join me in thanking all of our speakers here tonight mm.